Most of my memories with The Simpsons Hit and Run are actually about its advertising. I think this might be the first game that I remember seeing ads for, and they were everywhere. It felt like posters for the game were up in not only every video game store, but in every department store and shopping center too, and the kids magazine I collected, aptly named K-Zone, shout out to all the Aussie kids that remember it, ran a competition to win the game and a PS2 that I actually remember entering. But I didn't win, and for one reason or another, I never actually owned the game myself until now now. So my experience playing Hit and Run was limited to friends' houses and mucking around in the first level in high school to kill time. So while I have some good memories and some leftover fondness for the game, I certainly don't have that childhood undying love for it that I know a lot of people my age do. Turns out all that advertising worked really well on us. Because of this, I feel like I can cover Hit and Run a little more impartially than you might expect. It's often touted as one of the best licensed games of all time, and it's pretty much always touted as the best Simpsons game of all time, so as a Simpsons fan and as a licensed game connoisseur, uh, let's dive in to see what exactly makes this game so special to so many people, and as sacred as it is, let's see how it misses the mark in some ways. I need your chainsaw to chop up attacking zombies. But then how will I defend myself? Mo Mo Mo, shouldn't the weapons go to save people who have loved ones? Uh, yeah, I guess so. It's funny going back and reading the mostly 8 out of 10 hit and run reviews from way back in 2003. Uh, of course Grand Theft Auto was all the rage back then with Vice City breaking records earlier that year and GTA 3 changing the landscape two years earlier, so the reviews of this pretty much all unanimously make GTA comparisons, which is fair enough. Like with its open world renditions of Springfield, its mixed on foot and driving gameplay and its police chases, the influence is undoubtable, with many reviews going as far to say that this is GTA parody or satire. But aside from some self-referential tutorial screens and the very occasional fourth wall breaking line of dialogue, there's actually not a lot of parody going on here. It's a fairly cut and dry sort of game in that aspect, and the handful of meta jokes that there are don't aim for much more than a quick laugh. But if you set your mind back to 2003, before the big indie boom normalized fourth wall breaking, before modern internet meme culture, and before a lot of other open world games would flood the genre, it's not hard to see how these small gags were enough to pass this as parody at the time. Press the y button to get into the car and don't take all day, this is just the tutorial. It would have been quite refreshing, in fact, the writing in its entirety would have been and still is quite refreshing, mostly because the show's writers wrote the whole thing, including the dialogue, which is specifically important because the over Overarching plot about alien surveillance and robot wasps takes a backseat to just moment to moment one liners and sight gags. It feels like everything that pedestrians yell or the character you're playing as yells while driving is really quotable. Ooh, thanks a lot. It's that focus on the moment-to-moment -moment humor that gives the game a really good first impression. Starting it up and driving around as Homer might not be the typical big hook set piece opener, instead opting for the complete opposite where you're just driving to the quickie mart for some ice cream and coke, but there's just so many things to grin about. You'll almost always see at least one joke on the screen at any given time, and if you can't see one, then you can likely hear one. Uh, beyond that though, the carefully put together open world, if you can call it that, is just a joy to be in as a fan of the show. Uh, you can tell Springfield was hand designed to squeeze in as many secrets, recognizable locations, and deep cut references as it could. It rewards you for exploring with semi-hidden locations like rooftops and backyards filled with interactive jokes and collectibles to find, which fans like myself would appreciate as fans and kids would appreciate because kids love this sort of thing. Kids also love smashing stuff, which Hit and Run really caters to. Uh, pretty much everything that isn't tied down and then some things that are can be knocked over, whether it's by kicking it or crashing into it, and that includes pedestrians who'll flail about after the slightest touch. There's this wonderful story like during development where the team didn't want to show series creator Matt Groening that you could kick pedestrians, thinking that like he'd disapprove, but as soon as he picked up the controller as Homer, he kicked Marge across Springfield and loved every second of it. Hit and Run really taps into that Bart Simpson-esque childlike chaotic mischief as you watch all the physics objects fly everywhere and run over the Ralphs and Mill houses of the world. It's essentially a Simpsons themed toy box that invites you to muck around with all the pieces and see how they react, irrespective of any arbitrary restrictions. The bouncy, carefree, just have fun toy box approach is to some extent this game's lightning in a bottle moment. It immediately says to you that this is the game that really only cares about you having fun, so jump in, run over the B-man and have fun. Of course, run over enough B-men and crash into enough things to fill up the bar around the radar and you'll get a hit and run, where the police will start chasing 
chasing you, and the police here are unfortunately quite unfair and overpowered. It's a shame because not only did GTA prove how fun police chases can be, but the title of this game would imply that they're more fun than they actually are. Being so annoying, they work as more of a deterrent for crashing into things, which might be the point, but in a lot of ways they do literally feel like the fun police. Also, I hesitate to call this an open world because it's actually more like a large, elaborate circuit. Uh, the radar usually only shows one path, and when it does split with an intersection, it always loops in on itself and rejoins that single path to continue the circuit. And this is the case for not only the first suburbs area, but also the game's other two downtown and harborside maps, both of which are distinct and similarly great. The reason they're circuits is because Hit and Run is way more of a driving game than you might expect. It's, it's certainly more of a driving game than I remember. Remember, and thank god it is because the platforming is awful. It's floaty, imprecise, slow movement unless you sprint and too hard to control if you do. It almost seems like the developers knew how bad it was because the amount of main story platforming missions can be counted on one hand. Being on foot is frustrating and clunky but it just doesn't really matter. On the other hand, I was really surprised by how good the driving feels. I remember it being way more floaty than it is and while every vehicle does have incredibly high acceleration, that's actually pretty necessary given how cramped the streets are. You often unavoidably crash into things and need to quickly speed up again, so thank god you can, and it ends up being really really fast paced. The handbrake drifting feels grippy in the right ways, and the vehicles control uniquely enough that it genuinely matters what you're driving, whether it's a school bus or a flying broomstick. It's quite smartly put together. Eat my dust, dust eater! As soon as I'm done scratching myself, your history! Radical Entertainment, the developers behind this, did The Simpsons Road Rage two years earlier, a game that was so much of a crazy taxi clone that they got sued for it, so it kind of makes sense that the car handling in Hit and Run feels refined. Uh, Road Rage is in a lot of ways a sort of beta version of Hit and Run with its open levels, its constant dialogue, and its weird doughy Simpsons graphics. In fact, Hit and Run was originally conceived as a sequel to Road Rage, which explains the focus on the driving. Road Rage's levels are much more complex in the sense that they're not just circuits, like they fit more of an actual open world definition, and because of this it can be easy to get lost or take a wrong turn if you don't know what you're doing. Like if you take the wrong shortcut in Road Rage, that can ruin your entire run, but in Hit and Run they seem to have wanted to take this element out of the game with the map design. Destinations in Hit and Run are always cleverly placed between shortcuts, so if you see a shortcut in Hit and Run you should always take it, because it'll virtually always take you to where you're going. So really all you need to worry about is driving as fast as you can, not blowing up your car, and hitting as many shortcuts as possible. And because the game is so fast paced you wouldn't want to worry about anything more than that. For the most part there's really only a handful of mission types in the game that repeat in different ways, whether you're chasing someone down, racing someone, collecting items falling out of someone's vehicle, or trying to get somewhere within a time limit. In fact this game is filled to the brim with time limits, and with all the driving it's far more comparable to Driver than to Grand Theft. Auto. And just like Driver, the time limits are often really strict, so you'll need to learn where those shortcuts are and hit them every single time. And once you've realised this, it all just boils down to how skilled you are. There's no planning your route, there's no high level strategy, it's just drive fast, don't crash, and hit the shortcuts, which is really awesome in a way. It, it's very pure, so part of me is hesitant to even say this, but it does get repetitive over time due to this simplicity and due to the repeating mission types. Part of the problem is that you just master it pretty quickly. Uh, after you've played the first three chapters as Homer, Bart and Lisa respectively, the locations start repeating themselves and you'll pretty much be as good at the game as you're ever going to be. It doesn't help that every character controls exactly the same on foot, which I think is a missed opportunity, like why not give them unique character abilities? And again, the overarching plot is really quite poor with its ugly pre-rendered cutscenes and its whatever alien plot, which just hammers home the repetitiveness of it all because there's nothing really to look forward to story-wise. The rest of the game past chapter 3 is just as good as the start of the game, but only because it's basically the same as the start of the game. That's not to say that the rest of the game is forgettable, though I'd forgive anyone who forgot that Apu had his own chapter. One of my more vivid memories with this is watching friends try to beat the very last mission, which has since become one of those famously difficult levels that gets talked about like it's the stuff of video game legend. Uh, towards the end the difficulty really really spikes, and the final handful of missions basically fail you if you crash into walls, which isn't a thing anywhere else in the game, so you really do have to drive near perfectly to beat these missions, and even then you still might unavoidably crash due to the random element of the traffic. 
but I kind of love this though. Like, by this point, they've already shown you the whole game, so why not just throw in some blindingly frustrating missions at you? It's especially amusing thinking of the millions of kids out there trying their little hearts out to beat this. Like, it either taught those kids some resilience, or it's the source of their lingering anger issues. In all seriousness though, this really is a perfect game for kids, like, like, I get it, I, I see why everyone loves this game, and it goes further than just the mischief and the collectibles, like, obviously the extremely fast pace and the fun colours and the GTA for kids appeal of it is a big part of this, and there's something to be said for the dozens of unlockable clothes and the vehicles that kids can work towards, but it's also important to acknowledge that Hit and Run is one of those games that's so filled with obscure secrets that make the game feel a lot bigger than it is. Like. For example, the world theming changes depending on your console's date, so on Christmas it'll be Christmassy, or on Halloween it'll be Halloweeny, and there's secret vehicles to find, including a monorail, and there's just so many cool Easter eggs to find, not to mention the unlockable multiplayer minigame that I feel like is only in the game so that they can say one to four players is supported on the back of the box, but hey, it's still one of many cool unlockables. Like, it's just not hard to imagine kids back in the day bonding in the schoolyard over secrets and theories and stuff they did and found in the game. Most importantly though, The Simpsons Hit and Run is a kids game that doesn't treat kids like they're kids. It, it, it doesn't limit them in what they can do, going as far as letting them beat up and run over people, and it doesn't pull any punches with the humour as it has more adult jokes in there, and it clearly doesn't hold back with the difficulty. There's, there's just a really free feeling to it compared to other children's games, and, and because of this it's also a very entertaining game for adults too. Now I know I said it's repetitive, and it absolutely is over decent stretches of time, but that's all offset by just how fun it feels every time you boot it up. The poor overarching plot is drowned out by moment to moment gags, and the simplistic gameplay is drowned out by moment to moment thrills. It's a game that sacrifices long term satisfaction for short term joy, and that's not as bad of a thing as you might expect. Like, just like your favourite phone game or your favourite arcade game, Hit and Run is fantastic in short bursts, and and that's perfectly fine. So, as late as I am, I'm still really, really glad that I played this. It, it has that uniquely sixth generation heart to it that not many games do, and as far as I know, this was a complete mess of a development, so it's amazing that it turned out as good as it did, and it's even more amazing that it still feels like a real labour of love, and it now quite easily sits in my eyes as as well as most people's eyes I think, as the best Simpsons game ever made. It, it's not a mind-blowing gaming experience or anything, and it's really not groundbreaking in any way, but it's a jovial fun game that stood the test of time way better than many other open world PS2 games, and, and it's easily earned its millions of sales to me, and it's made me jealous of all those kids that grew up with it. And with that, we wrap up the Simpsons Hit and Run video. I um, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Um, if you want to support, liking and subscribing and commenting and all that helps with the algorithm, and that's also Patreon. And I want to thank my patrons, including all of them, including the ones coming up on the screen, and especially including my $5 patrons and up. Adam Beals, Analog Man, Blake Barnett, Boggy Online, Caden the Dingo, Chef, Chris Bushkis, I hope I'm pronouncing that one right, Devin Grandal, Dominic Chikoki, Evil Chicken, Gary Pay, Hero, I Saw Mini Me Making Babies Behind the Bike Shed with Labcat, Lucas Ray Sevic, Maximilian Kunzman, May Arise, Mazaki, Melanie G, Mustache Duct Tape, Mrs. Mini Me, Peaceful Kumquat, Riddlin for Kids, Tia, Test Drive Unlimited 2, The Mighty Mega Link, Thomas Damsgaard, Traplor Ross, Travis, Trixie Emerson, Under 10 Hours, Riding on Games, and Zindictive. As always, thank you for your support. I hope you all had a good holiday season. Happy New Year! And um, hope you all enjoyed the video. I'll talk to you all later. Bye.